to take your Bible and let's stand together. Let's acknowledge God's holy word, inspired, inerrant, infallible, perfect truth with no mixture of error. This is the moment when we surrender our lives to the authority of God's word and we say this out loud together every Sunday. Say this with me, open my eyes that I might receive wonderful words from your law. Amen, God bless you. Hey, take your Bible and turn in the New Testament to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians as we continue going verse by verse through Philippians. Today we take as our text Philippians 2, beginning in verse 12, and we'll read down through verse 18. I want to talk to you today on this subject. What's the greatest testimony a Christian can have? We're thinking about it in this room. We're thinking about it in the chapel. We're thinking about it as followers of God. What's the greatest testimony a Christian can have? The New Testament letter from Paul to the church at Philippi, Philippians 2.12. In the Christian Standard Bible, this is what... God's word says. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing, But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. God in heaven, would you bless the reading and the teaching of your word? Give us ears to hear and hearts that are sensitive and tender towards the leadership of your Holy Spirit. I pray if one in this room does not know Christ or one in the chapel does not know Christ, that today would be the day that they respond. For those of us that do profess faith in Jesus, may our testimony be wholehearted obedience. In the name of Christ, we pray, amen. Paul had just described what a citizen of heaven looks like. Paul essentially says at the end of chapter one, the beginning of chapter two, when it comes to a Christian, you should know it when you see it. Just as citizens of heaven, Philippians 1:27, live your life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, despite persecution, despite hardship, despite Paul, the leader, being incarcerated for his own personal faith in Christ, Paul is challenging these Philippians to live this way, live worthy of the gospel. Verses one and two of chapter two, seek seek unity with other Christians. Verse three, chapter two, do not be selfish or conceited. You know it when you see it. Verse four, consider the interest of others as more important than your own interests. Cultivate the same attitude and mindset of Jesus. Notice Jesus' descent. Notice Jesus' humility, his death on the cross, what's mentioned in the following verses. Verse 8 of chapter 2 is the key. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus was willing to let his obedience take him to the very bottom rung of the ladder. We hear so much about people climbing the ladder. He's climbing the ladder. So-and-so's climbing the ladder. Jesus descended the ladder for us. Jesus came all the way down, and he died the most despised death of all, a condemned criminal on an accursed cross. According to Paul, the humility and the obedience demonstrated by Jesus is our supreme example, our supreme motivation that we might live our lives with humility and obedience as people who wear his name. 
We've announced this every week. The theme of Philippians might be this. Sometimes following Christ is a pleasure. Other times following Christ can be painful. But every day we follow Christ, it is worth it. So here's today's big idea. I'm going to tell it to you. I'm going to talk about it. Then I'm going to remind you about it at the end. Here's the big idea. We're going to come back to this. We're going to talk about this. What's the greatest testimony a Christian can have? Listen, the greatest testimony a Christian can have is that he or she obeyed God with their life. In their life, they said yes to Jesus. And with their whole heart, they followed him their whole days. Fundamentally, Christianity is a matter of obedience. What is Christianity? Christianity is the decision that you must make about Christ. Will you follow him or not? Discipleship for Jesus was this, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. There's a reason that Christ's name is called master, king, lord, messiah, God. These are terms that indicate he's worth following. Mike Dura was my student pastor when I was a teenager, and he used to tell us this. You know what a testimony is, guys and girls? You know what a testimony is? A testimony is, what was your life before Christ? How did you meet Christ? And what difference has Christ made in your life since you met him? That's a testimony. What were you like before Jesus? How'd you meet Jesus? What difference has Jesus made since you met him? If you can't describe that, it ain't a testimony. Yeah, that's right. Testimony is, I heard from God. I responded to God and I'm obeying God. Notice how Paul began speaking to his audience in Philippians 2.12. He says, therefore, my dear friends, that's the Christian Standard Bible in the NIV, my dear friends, the King James and the New King James say, my beloved or my beloved friends. In other words, the issue of humility and Christian obedience, it's a church conversation. It's a family conversation. This is insider language. This is a Christian leader or a Christian pastor speaking to his Christian church family. My beloved, my dear friends, the problem in church today is that many of us expect way too much from the world and way too little from ourselves. We expect the world to be holy and the world to be godly and they need to get it right in Washington and they need to get... Lost people supposed to act like lost people. Paul's point is you can't worry about lost people, but it's a crying shame when saved people act like lost people. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the negative nature of the natural man can't discern the things of God. People that don't know Jesus hear a message about the cross or they hear a message about the Bible and they think... Psh. Can't tell me, can't tell me. Lost people are supposed to be selfish. They're supposed to be greedy. They're supposed to be unoffended by their sin. The issue for Paul is saved people who act lost. Well, Pastor Jeremy, how can you and I know the difference? How do we know? Well, according to Paul, you'll know it when you see it in your personal obedience, in your obedience. First, in verse 12, we see this. To have the testimony of obedience, the Christian has to do his or her part. To obey God, we have the responsibility to do our part. Paul is addressing the personal behavior of the Philippian Christians. Listen to this. He says, just as you have always obeyed, verse 12. The word obey means to hear under authority or to listen attentively, to heed, to conform, to hearken unto obedience. For Paul, with the word he uses here, it means listening, but by virtue of listening, you'll obey. It's listening saints who become obedient saints. It's similar to what James said in James 1.22. Don't just be hearers, but be doers. Deuteronomy 6.4. 
Hear, O Israel, listen, O Israel, the Lord, our God, he is one. And you should love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all, how does that begin? Hear, Israel, listen, listen, listen. And here's how we know if you've listened or not. Do you love him with everything? Ask any parent, any teacher, or any manager. The surest evidence that someone under your authority is listening (laughs) is that they respond affirmatively or obediently. Is there anything worse as a parent than, hey, that's how you do it. You go clean your room, go clean your room, go clean your room, go clean your room, go clean. Where was the first six times? If that listening hasn't moved to action, then there's no obedience. Paul says this, you obeyed when I was present, but even more now you're gonna obey when I was absent. Do it even more. This is spirit-filled Christianity. He's appealing to their want to, not their have to. He's saying, want to obey Jesus, long to obey Jesus. Not just because I'm challenging you to, but because Jesus is calling you to it. And he says this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out, work out, work out. For those people that don't like to work out, this isn't gonna be their favorite word. (laughs) Work full, accomplish. It means to toil, to labor, to minister. It means to surrender to God with reverence and fear. No, it doesn't say work for your salvation. Salvation is a gift by faith and God's grace, not works, Ephesians 2, 8. But in light of being a recipient of salvation, if we're truly saved, we should be willing to answer these questions. Am I a Christian? 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see if you're in the household of faith. In other words, Paul's saying, don't be afraid to look in your heart at times and go, do I still got this? Not that it ever left me, but am I, am I all in on this? Am I going through the motions or am I really saved? Am I living like a saved person? What would a devout Christian, what would an earnest follower of God that loves God, what would they be doing in this particular situation or in this particular season of their life? You gotta work that out. And you work it out, listen to this, with fear and trembling. Those are the words. Fear means alarm, it means fright. Trembling means to to quake with fear. Perhaps it means this, listen to me, in light of God's great gift of salvation, an eternal gift that I didn't earn and I would never deserve it on my own. How am I handling this thing called wearing the name of Christ? Am I presently living in light of this fact? Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the tomb, it means something and it's changing how I live. God's given you the most costly treasure, his son. What are you doing with it? You ever seen a first time parent hold their baby for the first time? (gasps) I've never, and I've been on some hospital visits, brother. Let me just tell you, I've been on some. And I've done it three times, Zeke, maybe. I've never seen, oh, kid, yeah, I mean, you, oh my. The baby, the baby. God's given you the most precious thing he could ever give you. How are you holding it? How's he holding you? This is very personal, and I mean very personal. I think at times fear and trembling, fear and trembling, it's, a euphemism for my personal doubts on the one hand versus the assurance I get from Christ on the other hand. Listen to me, church. Doubts do not mean I am unsaved. Doubts may be evidence that I wanna take my salvation very seriously and very carefully, and for that, it's a good thing. Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'm just telling you, and I'm not trying to call anybody out or single anybody out. And maybe I've said this foolishly at times in my life. I am so suspicious of people, suspicious that say this, bless God, brother, I'm so saved, I'm so saved. Man, I'm saved, been saved 25 years, ain't never doubted, not a second. Never? 
Like never. Well, ask the people that live with you. I bet they've seen some moments that made them wonder where you saved about your life. Come on, you ain't never, come on. I've doubted. I told my children this in a real, real meaningful moment last weekend. Guys, from age seven until my teenage years, there's no telling how many times I asked Jesus into my heart. Not that he was leaving, but that, God, I want to get it right. I want to be sure. And I'm not saying be so miserable that you doubt all the time. But listen to me. There is a sobriety and a humility in in confessing Christ. This is the most important decision of my life. I don't want to get it wrong. I'm learning what to do with my doubts. Take my doubts to Jesus. Take my doubts to the cross. You never doubted your love for me, Jesus. I rest in you. Fear and trembling. Why do we doubt at times? Why do we doubt? I bet there's some doubters in this room this morning. Why do we doubt? Well, our nature is that we're prone to forgetfulness. (laughs) We forget God's grace often. That's why my favorite line from Come Thou Fount, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. If you were like me, saved at a young age, saved a long time ago, it can be hard to remember the precise moment. And as you get older, you start going, oh, bless God, I was just a kid. Lord, they brainwashed me out of the tomb. I mean, I was in the nursery nine months before I was born. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it wasn't, a, I mean, they've been brainwashing me, Jack, since day one. Is this for real? I got to decide. We doubt sometimes when we compare our story to other people's story. Man, this guy, he gets saved. Man, he's doing like this in church. And man, he's, and you're just like, whoa, is that, do I have my We doubt because of spiritual warfare. We doubt because the devil wants us to doubt. We know this as Christians. Listen to me. Satan cannot steal my salvation. I am in God's hands. But listen to me. He will steal my joy and my peace every chance he gets. He wants me worried. He wants me consumed with doubt. This is precisely why the Bible calls us to remember so often. I've been reading through the Old Testament this year, and I'm blown away by how many times the Bible says, remember, remember, remember Abraham, remember Moses, remember coming out of Egypt, remember the Red Sea, remember the manna, remember the quail and the water from the rock, remember Jericho, this is all in the Bible, remember Canaan, remember that God crushed your enemies for you, remember, 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 fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. Fear and trembling means this. Am I saved? Yes, I pray so. If I've trusted Christ, I am. Who saved me? God saved me through Christ. For what purpose has God saved me? For his glory. So fear and trembling might mean this. I humbly trust in you, Jesus. A salvation I could never earn or deserve. A future I cannot predict. I'm holding on to you as you hold on to me. Number two, to have the testimony of obedience, we can trust God to do his part. I got to do my part, obey and work it out. But then God will do his part. Listen to verse 13. God is working in you to will and to work. This word will means it's God's choice. It's God's prerogative. What's going to happen as you come to him? It's God's work. That means it's his supply. It's his energy. I read this this morning from Henry Blackaby, quoting Isaiah. God's thoughts are higher than mine. God's ways are higher than mine. As the heavens are above the earth, God's thoughts and God's ways are higher than mine. Yet he is willing and working my life to write a story that only he could write. It's kind of like this. I let my kids, when we pull into the neighborhood, don't, don't, don't judge me. I'm just telling you what we do. I learned this from my dad. We, we pull into the neighborhood and, Daddy, can I drive? Yeah, you can drive. You can drive. They pop in my lap so fast, can't even reach the pedals. Both hands, 10 and 2. 
Daddy, I'm driving. I know you are, buddy. I'm driving. Look at me, Daddy. Look. Now, let me say this. To some extent, they are driving. But I never let my hand off the bottom of the wheel. I'm the one controlling the speed and the brakes. Thank God. Amen. So if I'm on your street, it's safe. It's safe, all right? But I give them a measure of freedom between the mailboxes. <laughs> you can go, you, you got a measure of freedom. You, you can do whatever you want, but I'm driving even as I let you drive. If we obey God's will, we will never lack God's supply. I am not saying that the Christian life is without struggle. But how much of our struggle might be that God's trying to keep us between the mailboxes and we think, well, I'm going to drive over here. I'm going to drive over here. I'm going to drive into this marriage and drive into that. I'm going to drive. I'm going to drive. I'm going to drive. My dad taught me this. When God's in something, it just has a flow to it. It just flows. When God's in something, we don't have to force or coerce or manipulate or push. When God's in something, it just flows. My word abide, my word remain. Be with Jesus, he'll live his life in you. So both of these are true. On the one hand, we must live a responsible Christian life. We must take it serious. We must work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But on the other hand, we must know this. There is nothing in my life that's good that's ever going to happen without God's grace or God's presence. And I'm nothing without him. Salvation is me responding to his good work and trusting him until my dying breath. Third, an obedient testimony is characterized by Christ-like attitude. I'm going to say this real fast. Christ-like attitude. Working out your salvation might look like this. Verses 14 through 16. He says, don't do this. Don't grumble and argue. Do this. Be blameless and pure. If you do it, it will look like this. You'll shine like the stars in a crooked, perverted world. Here's how. Achieving this by holding firmly to the word. <laughs> Don't do this. Grumbling and arguing. The word grumble means to murmur, to have a grudge. Grumbling means I might do it, but if I do it, I'm going to do it with a bad attitude. I might do it, but I ain't, I'm going to do it letting you know I don't want to do it. That's grumbling. Arguing means debating and combative. It means I could do it, but I'm not going to do it because my way is superior to you. I, I got a better idea than you, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to do it because it's, that's arguing. Now notice this: blameless, pure, be faultless, be innocent. Trust Christ. Let Him make you new, and if you do, you will shine like the stars. I love Second Corinthians six seventeen, y'all. This is still in the Bible. Be separate from among them and come out from them, says the Lord. Do not touch unclean things and I will accept you. Like this is a message of holiness and cleanliness. If you wear my name, you don't have the liberty to live like everybody else. Matthew 5, 16, you are the light of the world. You shine, shine, shine the light of Christ. And how do we do this? We firmly hold on to the Bible, firmly hold on. It's this idea of I'll, I'll grab on and I won't let go of the Bible. Even when it's not popular, I'm holding on to the Bible. Fourthly and finally, an obedient testimony is enhanced by living with eternity in mind. Notice how Paul concludes this in verses 16 through 18. Paul compares his life, verse 17, to being poured out. In the Old Testament, they would pour the blood of the animal out in worship. They would pour out wine. They would pour out their grain. They would pour out their food. This is their way of saying, Lord, we trust you, not ourselves. Paul's saying, my life's being poured out for you, and I'm glad. Writing this from prison, I'm being poured out, yet I'm glad. And you can only live and minister with this type of selfless attitude if you really believe Jesus Christ is worth it. And that Jesus is coming again one day to settle the score. And until Jesus comes back, listen, everything we do for him matters. So the greatest testimony a Christian can have is obedience. Maybe yours is saving grace, like Pastor Johnny's. What's he saved you from? What's he snatched you out of? 
What's he delivered you from? Or maybe yours can be like keeping grace like mine. I used to not like mine. I thought it was really boring. But the older I get, the more I'm grateful for it. Keeping grace. I was saved when I was seven. Hadn't, you know, done a lot of the things. That, uh, but by God's grace, I hadn't. By God's grace, I, I'm not. Well, well, it's, whether it was grace to save you for something or keep you from something, it's all grace. And the greatest testimony is that when God's grace appears in your life, you hear it, you respond, and you obey. Do I obey God with my life? Majority of the time? Fraction of the time? Any time? Do I obey God with my life? If you're saved, the pattern and the character and the habit of your life should be obedience. Last Sunday, I went to preach at our Jasper campus, and I was so moved. God was in that place, Pastor Eddie and Jeremy Law leading us in singing. And Jeremy led this song, the 8 a.m. service. 8 a.m. service. They still do it early up there in Jasper. It's like sunrise every Sunday up in Jasper. <laughs> led this song by Christian Stanfield of passion called Follow You Anywhere. And I was weeping on the front row because I was hearing these ly lyrics. And I wanted it to be so true of me. You are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear with you by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. Really? There's a million reasons to trust him. And not one not to trust him. Why won't we trust him? Oh, wherever you lead me. Whatever it costs me, all I want is you. All I want is you, Jesus. Or, how about this one? Take up my cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I gave my life to ransom thee. Surrender your all today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll take my cross and follow him. Wherever he leads, I'll go. What's the greatest testimony of a Christian? The greatest testimony of a Christian is this. Wherever God leads... That's where I want to go.